Hello and welcome to a quick video where I'm going to explain all the different fields that arise in Maxwell's equations and give you an intuitive understanding of how they work and why you should care about them. You may have seen Maxwell's equations written in the following form, which relates the E field to the B field, as well as to any charge densities that may be present at any current densities. You may also have seen that we can define something called the electric potential from which we can derive the electric field, as well as a vector potential from which we can derive the magnetic field. But then you may also have seen that something called the D field, the P field, the H field, and the M field, and these have names such as the displacement field, the polarization, the magnetization, and then confusingly, the H field is often called the magnet magnetic field, which is the same label we use for the B field. So if you're a little bit confused by all these fields, don't worry, we're going to go through them one by one and show intuitively how they work. First of all, let's consider the simple case of the J field. Now, this current density simply arises when you have a collection of charges moving through a region with a surface area A in some direction. In that case, you can define J as simply being the number of charges passing through the region per second divided by the area, and then of course oriented in the correct direction like so. So again, intuitively, that should be fairly easy to understand. Now, for understanding the E and the B field, we can place a known charge at a certain location, give it a known velocity, and then if there's an E field and a B field present, we can compute the total force on that charge, which will be given by the Lorentz force law like so. Now, that's probably something you've seen before, but I want to just highlight why it's important. It's important because it shows that the E field and the B field are sort of real physical fields that have a very uh, concrete effect, namely that they cause charged par particles to accelerate. So, um, in some sense, they're the most important fields in Maxwell's equations. To understand the electric potential phi, we can imagine creating a charged particle, capital Q, over here, which sets up an electric field that may vary with distance. And then we can place another charge, lowercase q, right here, and then consider what happens if we push it from A towards B, which is closer to Q. In other words, like how much energy does it take, how much work does it take to move this charge, lowercase q, all the way from A to B. Well, to compute this work, we have to integrate the force over distance. And in this case, we uh, use a minus right here because we want the work to be positive when we move against the field set up by a positive charge. And again, note we're assuming both these are positive, but it, the same thing is still true for um, two negative charges. So if we swap in the uh, expression for an uh, electric field right here, or the electric force rather, then we get the total work for this particular charge, Q. But of course, it'll be a bit more generally convenient to look at the amount of work per charge unit. So if you divide through by Q, we get the following expression for a line integral, which is essentially saying that we can compute the uh, amount of work per unit charge by simply either integrating against the electric field or evaluating the so-called electric potential at two locations and then subtracting the values. So again, the general idea here is that the value of phi will increase when you move towards positive charges. Furthermore, if you take the gradient of this uh, scalar field right here, you can recover the electric field like so, which essentially implies that a big change in the scalar field implies that we have a big local E field. Now, this actually shows one of the advantages of using the scalar field because when you're working with the electric field directly, you have to keep track of three um, components, both the X, Y, and Z components. But for the scalar field, you just have to keep track of a single one, and then you can always recover the other three components of the E field by just taking the gradient. So instead of working with three things, we can get away with working with just one, and always recover the E field by just taking the, the gradient. So that's kind of why phi is so convenient. All right, what about the vector potential here? So to understand this, let's first consider a simple case where we have a wire with a certain current density, a sort of running current out of the screen towards us. And then we have a B field that sort of circles around it, which you may have seen before. We're going to assume here we have no E fields present. In that case, one of Maxwell's equations reduces to the following form, where J is the curl of B. Now, depending on how familiar you are with vector calculus, this may either be very obvious or very, uh, I guess, obscure to you. But basically, this equation says that J is the thing that B spins around. And that should kind of make sense if you look at the picture here, because you can see that B spins around in a circle like this, and we have J in the, the middle like so. If we then look at the definition of the vector potential and notice that they have the same form as before, we can see that it basically reads that B is the thing that A spins around. So if you have a uh, sort of B vector going around like this, then we should have A sort of spinning around each one of those little arrows. And if we uh, also go through the math, we can show that the A field should basically be pointing straight out of the, the screen like, show, like so everywhere with a decreasing strength as we move away. Now, um, as a general rule of thumb, it's handy to remember that a will generally be parallel to J, but a location with an A field doesn't necessarily have a J field at the same location. You can see here we only have the J field located in the exact center of this system, but we have an A field everywhere else like so. But still the sort of parallelity rule of thumb here is quite quite convenient. 
just to make sure that we understand this completely, let's consider another example, this time of a um, toroidal current loop. So you have to imagine taking a donut and wrapping wire around it and then running a current through it. Here we're seeing basically a cross-section of that system where you can see the current is like running through in loops like this. So if we use the same equation as before, we can see that the B field must be pointing into the donut right here, sort of going all the way around and then coming out here and looping back in the donut like so. If you look at the expression for the vector potential, we can see that basically A should be sort of spinning around the B vectors, which basically should give us a field like this. And indeed, if we do the math, we get something that does loop around the, the B field like so. Okay, so that's all well and good, but so far it seems like the A field is just a mathematical device for computing the B field and may even be kind of a, an inconvenient tool for doing that. But it turns out that A actually has some real physical significance. First of all, to compute E correctly, you have to take into account both the gradient of the scalar potential, but also the time derivative of the, um, of the A field here. Furthermore, it turns out that the total momentum of a particle in motion that's charged uh, consists of both a term that relates to the mass of the particle and its uh, velocity, but also a term here that relates to the uh, momentum of the field surrounding the particle, which again depends on A. Furthermore, there is something called the aharonov bohm effect, which shows that A is a real physical quantity and not just a mathematical device for computing the B field. It's maybe a bit beyond the scope of this presentation, but essentially, if we set up a double slit experiment where we send a single particle onto these two slits simultaneously, then it's gonna, well, there's gonna be a path on top here that goes to the screen here and a path below that also goes to the same screen where an interference pattern will be formed. But if you place a solenoid right here and run a current through it, then it's gonna set up a B field inside and an A field outside. So the observation here is that the path on top will basically be moving against the direction of the A field, while the path below will be moving with the direction of the A field. So if you increase the current inside of the solenoid here, you're gonna increase the A field and therefore increase the phase difference between the path on top and the path at the bottom, which is going to alter the interference pattern you observe over here. So in other words, this shows that A isn't just a mathematical tool, it really does affect quantum mechanical particles on a very fundamental level by changing their, their phase. Okay, so now we're ready to understand the P field and the D field. And to get into that, we first have to understand what an electric dipole is and how it behaves. An electric dipole is simply a system of charges where a positive and a negative charge has been separated by a certain distance. In that case, we can define a P vector, which is simply oriented from the negative side to the positive side with a magnitude of the positive charge Q here, multiplied by the distance of separation D. So in that case, we can write the following expression for the field of the dipole and graph it over here. So if you assume that it's infinitesimally small and located in the center, we get this sort of interesting figure eight pattern coming out here for the electric dipole. Now that's all well and good, but it's actually very rare to have just a single isolated electric dipole floating around in free space. It's much more common for dipoles to be part of a larger material object. Something could be, um, some, or rather an example could be an electret, which is a case where the uh, dipole field is all frozen and locked in place, always, the, always constant. But um, maybe a more common example could be something like a dielectric where uh, something like glass and plastic, where the dipoles arise when you apply an external field. But whatever the case, the point is that um, if you look at the field outside of one such material with a bunch of dipoles, we get something that looks a lot like the uh, field from just a single dipole. It still has this sort of figure eight behavior, as you can see here. But if you look inside, we get something that's almost uniform. And in some sense, it shouldn't be too surprising, because if we look at all the dipoles that are present in the material like so, and we compare the bottom row here to the second row, we can see that all the positive charges in the bottom row are right next to all the negative charges in the second row, which means that their effect essentially should cancel each other out. And that's gonna happen all the way throughout the whole stack here until we reach the end, in which case we basically have a positive charge distribution on top and a negative one in the bottom. But that actually looks a lot like the uh, field set up by a set of parallel plate or parallel plate capacitor with a positive charge on top and a negative at the bottom, which again should set up a field that points vertically downwards. So the interesting thing is that the overall field that would be created by the dipole sort of seems to point up, but it gets kind of counteracted by this capacitor field also set up by the dipoles. So one question we can ask is, well, how would the overall E field look if you could sort of remove or at least ignore this very strong but also very predictable contribution from the, uh, let's say, the um, capacitor field set up by the dipoles? To compute that, we simply take the total E field and remove this capacitor contribution, which again must be um, oriented along the opposite direction of P, so we need a minus right here. So this minus this minus turns into a plus, and we get the following expression here after multiplying through by epsilon naught to keep all the units consistent. So what we get is simply this diagram here of the D field everywhere. Now that may look a little bit boring because it's kind of similar to the previous one we got for the total E field, but there's an important difference that we just want to highlight here. If we imagine walking through the, uh, the medium here and recording the E field all along, all along the way, 
we can see that it's quite high outside, but then drops very quickly when we enter the medium, and then it increases quite quickly when we exit again. So this kind of big change can be a little bit cumbersome to work with for certain calculations. But if you look at the D field instead, which removes this capacitor contribution in the middle, we get a field that's much more smooth and easy to work with. And that can be very convenient for a lot of compensations using Maxwell's equations. And we can always recover the E field if we know the material properties of the, uh, the substance in here. Okay, so again, the point about the D field is that outside the medium, it behaves just like the total E field being set up by dipoles and charges or whatever else is present. But inside a medium with uh, dipoles, it removes the very strong but also very predictable uh, capacitor E field that is anti-parallel to P. And the overall result is a new helper field that's more smooth and easy to work with for a lot of compensations. And of course, that's very convenient. Now, with that in mind, we're ready to understand the H field and the M field. So in this case, we're going to look at magnetic dipoles. And these behave simply like a... Um, small current loop with uh, electricity running through it. Now, in reality, when you deal with magnetic phenomena, they're actually caused by the spin of quantum mechanical particles, which are not really the same as a small current loop, but at least for the purpose of modeling the fields that surround these dipoles, it's okay to assume that they just behave as if they're small current loops. In any case, we can define an M vector that points through the loop with a magnitude i, which is the current inside, multiplied by a, which is the area of the loop, and then multiplied by a vector that points upwards according to the right-hand rule. So you can see if you put your fingers through the cross here and loop them around so they come out of the dot here, you get something that sort of points upwards like this. And as before, we can of course compute the field from a single dipole and graph it over here. So we see this sort of a great behavior as well. But once again, it's very uncommon to have just a single dipole located somewhere in space. It's much more common for them to be arranged in some kind of solid material like a magnet. And um, if we do that and look at the uh, field that surrounds it, we can see that outside it looks a lot like the field from a single dipole, still has a sort of figure eight behavior, but inside it's almost uniform, just points straight up. Once again, that shouldn't be too surprising because if we look at all the uh, individual current loops that are present here, and we compare the first column to the second one, we can see that right here, all of the currents going into the page and all the ones coming out will basically be present at the same location, so they're gonna cancel each other out. And the same thing will happen all the way throughout the whole uh, set of columns until we get a situation where currents only coming out at the left-hand side and only going in on the right-hand side. So overall, that looks a lot similar to an ideal solenoid, which of course will have a very strong, very uniform magnetic field pointing straight up. And you can see this solenoid contribution will overall be quite strong, but also very predictable, just point up, point up vertically. So now we can ask the question, how would the overall B field look if we're able to remove this very strong but very predictable contribution to the total B field that stems from the solenoid behavior of the, uh, of the dipoles? So to compute this, we just take the total B field from before, subtract out this uniform solenoid part that's present where the magnetization is not zero. And in this case, of course, the solenoid contribution is parallel with M. So we just end up with the following expression for the H field after dividing through by mu naught. So in this case, we can see the H field looks like so. Note that right now the uh, vectors inside are actually pointing down, which is opposite of what we saw for the case of the D field. In any case, if we run the same thought experiment of going through the middle of the material here, we can see that if we record the B field all along, it's going to be quite small outside, but then jump up to high value inside and then uh, decrease quite quickly when you exit it. And again, this kind of very discrete jump in the B field strength can be inconvenient to work with for some calculations. So if we look at the H field instead, it's much more smooth overall. Another observation we can make here is that the H field kind of looks as if it's being set up by two sets of monopoles with positive monopoles up here and negative ones down here. Now, that's not to say that uh, monopoles actually exist or, or at, least not, at least not magnetic ones. It's just kind of a mathematical curiosity that the overall field you get for H looks as if it's being solved by monopoles, which again can be convenient for certain, certain calculations. All right, so again, the point about H is that outside the medium, it behaves just like the total B field that arises from dipoles and currents or whatever else is present. But inside a medium with dipoles, it removes the very strong but very predictable solenoid contribution to that field, which is parallel to M. And overall, this new helper field is much more smooth and easier to work with for certain calculations. Of course, that's a very convenient thing. All right, so I hope you enjoyed this short video on all the different fields in Maxwell's equations. Feel free to check out some of my other videos over here and stay tuned for more. Bye-bye.